Are there supernatural powers that can predict the future or influence events? Many who practice channeling, astrology, and tarot believe there are. Others have tried to offer proof. Among those who have claimed to have the power of the occult is Aleister Crowley. He believed that he could focus his mind and bend anyone to his will. One day in the 1920s, as he walked down a New York street, with his friend William Seabrook, he put his powers on display. Seabrook asked for a demonstration of this. So Crowley pointed to a gentleman who was walking down the street and said, watch this. And Crowley then began to mimic the, the walk and the step of that person. And then Crowley suddenly dropped to a crouch and stood up again. And the person he was mimicking slipped and fell on the sidewalk and then got up and looked for a banana peel or whatever and couldn't figure it out. And that was Crowley's demonstration of one of his newfound magical powers. The story is legendary in occult circles held as proof of a concept called action at a distance. Occultists in general believe that they can affect things uh, far away, uh, whether they can divine them and see them far away, or whether they can actually influence things far away. Magic is both an art and a science. Certain things cause certain effects to happen. Um, at the same time, they have to be done with a certain intention and perhaps a certain flair in order to work. Was Crowley a master of 20th century occult magic, as some have claimed? His beliefs were nothing new. Crowley took his lead from the Egyptians, early occultists who believed that spells could heal the sick and make crops grow. Some things that seem supernatural can often become accepted fact. Sir Isaac Newton believed that an invisible force called gravity that held planets in orbit around the sun created action at a distance. Newton hesitated to share his groundbreaking theory of gravity for fear that it would be branded as magic. Science nowadays really is touching against ideas dealing with where magic and spirituality and religion um, intersect. And they're both ways of trying to find out about how the world works. The occult means secret or hidden, and its early masters were regarded as true magicians but they were also the first scientists. Their discoveries in the occult arts of astrology and alchemy gave birth to modern scientific disciplines. You go back to ancient times, there was no science. So the magicians and the alchemists and the proto-mathematicians, they were doing science, but they were also doing literature and philosophy and cosmology and religion, and there was no sorting out of those uh, things. Since the birth of what we would call modern science, science and the occult have sort of uh, separated the paths. Many still view the occult with suspicion, but modern science is often working on the edge of the supernatural, trying to solve mysteries that confronted the first magicians. Serious physicists are contemplating time travel. Serious physicists are contemplating parallel universes. Serious physicists are trying to understand the 11 dimensions of string theory. And when you get into those realms, you start to look to myth and uh, sort of magical thinking and almost surreal thinking as a way to even talk about those things. Were the early occult masters keepers of secrets that modern science is only beginning to rediscover? The trail of the occult begins in Egypt 5,000 years ago. Just before the rise of Egypt's great pharaohs, hieroglyphics or pictographs were invented. Egyptians used them to document their history and religion and to practice complex systems of astronomy, astrology, and geometry. They believed their powerful knowledge came from the god Thoth. Thoth, or Tehuti, was the Egyptian god of magic. And more than just the god of magic, he was the god of writing, of astronomy, of mathematics and science. He invented language, he invented writing. Only priests with special training were allowed access to Thoth's sacred knowledge. Imhotep, builder of the first pyramid, was one of the chosen. Thoth was considered to be the one who gave us writing and numbers and the um, arts of self-cultivation through works of consciousness. Some people thought he was a person who was then deified through his accomplishments. Other people feel that this has been a mythical entity from the beginning. 
Legends held that a book of magic written by Thoth contained the secrets of the gods. The Book of Thoth was actually considered to be um, in the astral plane, not a physical thing, but something that you had to actually travel in consciousness to arrive at. And so uh, this is probably one of those very old incidences of channeling where an individual would get into a special state of mind, contact the Thoth energy wherever it was to be found, and then be tutored by this uh, multilingual, multi-code kind of consciousness. If you were to describe the Book of Thoth, you could also, you know, look at, at a building like the Pyramid or the Sphinx and say that the teachings contained therein are pages within the Book of Thoth. So all measurement, all words, all concepts are part of the Book of Thoth. But no Book of Thoth has ever been found. The god is said to have buried it beneath the Nile and protected its secrets with a deadly curse. Modern archaeologists eventually discovered that the Babylonians had created much of the knowledge Egyptians credited to Thoth. As early as 4000 BC, they were the first to measure planetary movements they invented the abacus, the first sequential numeric system, and some of the earliest forms of astrology and astronomy. This information spread to Egypt and helped launch one of history's greatest cultures. And like the Egyptians, the Babylonians regarded their knowledge as divine. Every temple was an observatory. It was actually an astronomical uh, site for watching the planets. The whole concept of divining means trying to understand the will of the gods. And in order to understand the will of the gods, you have to have something to read about them, something that you see they're doing. The Babylonians used one of the occult's oldest arts to understand their world, divination, or accessing the supernatural. The movements of the planets through the heavens used to be considered the footprints of the gods and goddesses. And when they would catch up with each other and have interactions, or one would go retrograde and then go forward again, these things were all uh, understood to affect the world. It began in the Stone Age, when shamans invoked the spirits to ensure the success of the hunt. Certain people who were uh, distinguishable by early man as having sort of mystical experiences, and these would be the religious representatives of the clan. These people would have been communicating in, in ways of imagination to kind of talk to the gods or talk to the spirits or um, uh, affect certain things that would happen. In Egypt, divination developed into a sophisticated system of rituals and ceremonies designed to contact the gods who ruled their world. Of course, you were trying to influence uh, things like your success in business or the crops. The Egyptians used rituals, they used incantations, they used the symbols to convey the, all of those things. The Pharaoh himself was the head of their religion, so that he was probably the chief practitioner of both their religion and their magic. Much of what is called ceremonial magic, the casting of spells, the use of magic words and incantations, came from the Egyptians. When Phoenician traders spread this knowledge throughout the Mediterranean world, magic became practical. They codified an alphabet that would line up the sounds of speech, the number canon, and the zodiacal signs, planets, and uh, features in the heavens so that you could, with this alphabet, spell sacred words. You could also count and, and figure and calculate, and you could also do astronomy. The sacred origins of these disciplines were gradually forgotten. In 1212 BC, Ramses II, the last great pharaoh of Egypt, died. Invading armies conquered the land of the Nile. Its occult secrets were lost, but not forever. After the decline of Egypt's extraordinary culture, another civilization rose, Greece in the 6th century BC. It was aided by one of the most probing minds in history, Pythagoras. Our alphabet, the buildings that surround us, even the music we hear, owes a debt to this brilliant philosopher. In his pursuit of wisdom, Pythagoras traveled broadly, searching for lost occult knowledge. He found it in the mystery schools scattered throughout many different cultures. Pythagoras synthesized the elements of these teachings into a new discipline, philosophy. Its foundation, numbers. He believed that mathematics 
and philosophy and an understanding of the divine all went together. We can't say he originated anything, but he condensed and boiled down the knowledge of the world and then brought it to a practical uh, application. Pythagoras identified numbers as the most fundamental elements of creation. As we look at science in this day and age, we're finding that the whole world is filled with these mathematical constants. You've got pi, you've got the speed of light, you've got you know, the force of gravitation. So the idea that numbers describe the world seems to be the case. In 518 BC, Pythagoras opened a school in the Croton region of southern Italy. His carefully selected disciples were called Mathematicoi. Their initiation was rigorous. Three introductory years, followed by five years of absolute silence, then five more of training. Only then were students ready to learn the most sacred mysteries of numbers. He wanted to produce philosophers like himself, so you had to be very circumspect, you had to be very self-controlled to be able to even be in his school. Pythagoras turned the numbering system of the Babylonians into a sacred science. They believed that number was like God, and to, me, to connect with this was to be talking to God. And so from that arises a, a whole lot of symbolism that later becomes numerology, Kabbalah, things like that. Pythagoras discovered that the mystery schools shared the belief that all of creation was at one with God. He did a huge amount uh, of explaining sacred mathematics by showing how the one splits and becomes two, the two finds a synthesis and becomes three, the three breaks open and becomes the 10,000 things. And that same story you read in the I Ching, you read in other metaphysical ancient documents because everybody was trying to understand how do we get number out of all. Many credit Pythagoras and his school with the development of numerology and the efficient Greek alphabet eventually adopted by much of Western culture. Pythagoras also applied numbers to decode music, which Greeks regarded as the language of the gods. He invented the monochord, which defined the numerical ratios of the musical scale. Pythagoras believed he had solved the mysteries of the universe. But there was also this idea that there was a music of the spheres, that the heavens itself was playing a sort of orchestral piece. The planets themselves stack up around the sun at harmonic intervals. White light breaks out into color at harmonic intervals. Sound is also harmonically, uh, you know, the, the, the harmonic sequence that comes out of any given note, those nodes of overtones are all governed by the same mathematics. So it was Pythagoras who articulated harmonic math to the West. Ultimately, the exclusivity of Pythagoras' school caused its downfall. In 508 BC, the school was burned to the ground. There was a point at which his schools were attacked and destroyed and some of his followers killed. Pythagoras himself left and went off into the countryside and died, and no one really knows what happened. Some people think that he committed suicide, but it's, it's a mystery, no one's really sure. The society was hounded into extinction. Generations of later Greeks built upon Pythagoras' philosophy, and Aristotle turned it into science. But then came Christianity, and for the next thousand years, religion cast a long shadow over science and the occult. During the first 15 centuries of Christianity, occult knowledge was driven underground. When the Judeo-Christian consolidation of Western spirituality became the enforced model, magic was really moved way off to the sidelines and became a, a dark and forbidden subject. Priests were the intermediaries between people and the divine. Christianity also wielded unparalleled political influence. The church had uh, developed a hierarchy. It had developed the idea that the uh, pope uh, took his uh, word from God and then passed that down to the rest. And the church had also cemented itself uh, with certain monarchs. The church closely guarded its exclusive access to divine authority. Like every other in-crowd group, if everybody can do it, then you can't claim that your guys are you know, special. For centuries, Western Europe lived largely under church control. In the Middle Ages, magic became a rebellious act 
perpetrated almost as an anti-Christian or an, uh, an anti-authoritarian type of behavior. The church singled out occultists, condemning them because they believed that an individual could have direct access to God. They took the whole concept of, of uh, church hierarchy, priest, the church itself as a place of worship and said, no, you don't need any of this stuff. What you need is to work on discovering within yourself that divine spark. But in the 14th century, the occult would rise again. Ironically, the church's holy war, the Crusades, was in part responsible. Monasteries to the east on the border of the Muslim world had preserved many of the ancient Greek and occult texts, studying them as curiosities. Returning crusaders brought a number of these documents back to Europe with them. This learning started to trickle back, and little things were found in monasteries, a bit of scripture here, a bit of text there. Uh, and so the rumors were around that there had been greater learning in the past. This rediscovery fueled an extraordinary rebirth of culture. Well, this was the point people began to realize, oh, there was wisdom amongst the ancients. You have uh, a new reverence for uh, Egyptian and Greek and Roman uh, and Hebraic tradition because people are looking for uh, really empowering knowledge and looking to understand the secrets of the ancients. Art and science swept through Western Europe in the 1400s as it ushered in the Renaissance. Leading the movement into new ways of looking at old knowledge was the German physician Paracelsus. Born in Germany in 1493, Paracelsus trained in traditional medicine but also studied alchemy. Ultimately, forced out of school for challenging the status quo, he embarked on a nomadic life supporting himself with astrology readings. In his far-flung travels, he sought knowledge from any source he could find. Paracelsus went around Europe and uh, talked to barbers, talked to witches, talked to midwives, talked to, you know, the village healer, and gathered together from everywhere what worked. And this was his huge, uh, final stance is I use what works. He rejected outworn theories, ventured beyond accepted boundaries. His pioneering experiments with minerals and chemicals laid the foundation for modern medicine. It was just the beginning of a scientific revolution. The next century would herald the discovery of an occult text that went against more than tradition. It was a threat to the power of the church. The Renaissance brought about a new spirit of learning, and academies sprung up throughout Europe. In the 15th century, Marsilio Ficino founded one of Italy's most progressive. With the support of his patron, Cosimo Medici, Ficino acquired and translated a collection of documents reputedly authored by a mysterious Egyptian magician named Hermes Trismegistus. An emissary from the uh, Orthodox Church brought a cache of documents, and Ficino found, uh, I think it was 12 books supposedly written by Hermes. They um, weren't necessarily all written as one book, but they, got, they were gathered together once these translations were made. The documents which became known as the Hermeticum contained teachings from the early Christian era that had been lost for centuries. Their pedigree appeared to be impeccable. The name of their supposed author, the mysterious Hermes Trismegistus, was a combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth, the two greatest gods of Greek and Egyptian magic. There was occultism in there. There were esoteric doctrines. There was alchemy. There was uh, magic. There was astrology. And Pacino and his school considered these documents to be extremely old, predating Plato, in fact, and having come from Egypt. Scholars would determine that the man Hermes Trismegistus never existed. What Ficino was translating was a compendium of Greek lore about how an individual could cultivate themselves and become enlightened. 
raising of a given individual's consciousness until they are like the gods. The books were set up as a series of dialogues between the god Hermes and others who conveyed the secrets of the universe. One of the documents was a short piece called the Emerald Tablet, which became the Bible of Renaissance occultists. On this tablet, it was said, I, these are all legends, um, that there were uh, 12 or 13 lines, and these lines started with, as above, so below. Um, this was the great idea of the pattern of the universe, the pattern of the stars and the, the great universe is repeated as well on the earth. The Hermeticum restated the teaching of the early mystery schools, that human beings possessed a divine nature. So this is really the goal of hermetic initiation and any other kind of initiation would be to transcend our mortality and put us back into our ultimate state as spiritual uh, peers. The Hermeticum dazzled Renaissance scholars and occultism was reborn. Could the idea that human beings shared a direct link to God undermine the authority of the church? The discovery of the Hermeticum during the Renaissance created a new generation of occultists. They sought to combine religion with science and magic, a dangerous undertaking in a society ruled by Christianity. John Dee would risk his life to study its teachings. John Dee was a giant. John Dee was the embodiment of the ideal of an enlightened being who had the uh, spiritual understanding of his role and mission in life and who was gifted with you know superior intelligence but like Pythagoras he would pay a heavy price for daring to seek out the wisdom of the gods the ultimate Renaissance man D followed in the footsteps of Paracelsus using experimentation to become a gifted scientist an inventor a mathematician a brilliant cryptographer and a pioneer in the field of navigation. But he was also an occultist, he was a sorcerer, he was an astrologer, he was in fact Queen Elizabeth's personal court astrologer. And in that sense, his interests were all very much in keeping with the thinking of the time. There wasn't a distinction made between magic and science, and he was pursuing an understanding of the world around him. When Queen Elizabeth rose to the throne of England in 1558, she installed Dee as court astrologer. But his influence reached far beyond his position. England's famous magician was also a spy for the Queen. He was involved with political intrigue. He was a uh, trusted ally of, of the uh, Queen, but he was also working behind the scenes throughout Europe to helped to lower the power of the church and to substitute Protestant power in its stead. With Dee's guidance, Queen Elizabeth officially legitimized the most significant occult science of the Renaissance, alchemy. Alchemists had two goals, to heal illness and to turn base metal into gold. They believed success could be achieved by finding the philosopher's stone a mystical agent that would also produce a higher level of consciousness in the alchemist. That was really an approach to trying to understand the way the physical world works, and alchemy as a practice you know, was the forefather of modern chemistry. Alchemy had existed since the early Egyptians, but in the hands of the Renaissance scientists, it reached new heights. Everything that we know and do today in our modern science was uh, developed by the alchemists. Laboratory techniques were part of the alchemical tradition. The observation of results, the scientific method is, is a child of alchemy. Alchemists were on the leading edge of science. They discovered phosphorus, zinc, the distillation of alcohol, the germ nature of diseases. They were the first to understand how blood circulates in the body. The church viewed their unorthodox experiments and scientific breakthroughs with growing suspicion. We are speeding up what nature does. We're speeding up the rate at which the metals evolve. We're speeding up the rate at which medicines are combined and, and raise consciousness. And the church felt that you can't be speeding up God's creation without recourse to demons. 
Despite his work in alchemy, Dee's true occult passion lay in divination. He believed that he could apply scientific methods to communicate with supernatural beings. Dee's obsession with contacting the angels would have disastrous consequences. This art of manipulating objects like bones, tea leaves, and tarot cards had arrived from the Muslim East in the 14th century and become a popular method of fortune telling. But Dee used a divination method known as scrying. Dee relied on looking into a crystal ball that would reflect back supernatural information. Scrying is a long time old technique, scrying into glasses, mirrors, bodies of water, anything that would have a reflective surface, uh, and see if you could see not just the material things, but the spiritual things standing behind. These efforts were unsuccessful until one day a young man named Edward Kelly appeared at his door. Kelly seemed to have the talent to see into the shadow world. Their system involved Edward Kelly looking into a amethyst crystal and describing what he saw and John Dee would then record these uh, communications. Kelly began receiving messages from the angels. They spoke in a language he called Enochian, from the lost biblical book of Enoch. These transmissions are early examples of what New Age followers now call channeling. What Dee and Kelly brought forth was completely new. It was not based on tradition. He appeared to be speaking a new language. The Enochian language does appear to have a coherent vocabulary and syntax, and this doesn't seem like the sort of thing that Kelly, who was not a particularly educated or schooled person, could have just invented. He couldn't have faked something like that. John Dee and Kelly embarked on a tour of Europe to share their discoveries, just as the Inquisition launched another crackdown against heretics. All you needed was a slight change in political or religious circumstance, and something that was considered exceptionally wonderful would then be considered demonic and scary. Dee returned home to England to find that a mob had destroyed his irreplaceable library and scientific and occult instruments. Dee had fallen out of favor with the court. The man who began as a leading scientist of the Renaissance ended his life penniless, branded as a sorcerer. Dee's main legacy was not to science, it is to magic. And it's because of those who have come after, who have seized upon what he created and made it into a new worldview, whether it's consciousness arts or ceremonial magic or divination, could take place inside these new parameters that they set up. John Dee's fall was the beginning of the occult's end. The practices were reviled by the church as the work of demonic possession. From the 14th through the 16th century, more than 40,000 people would be executed for witchcraft. Occult ideas became embedded in the traditions of secret societies, such as the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians. They were tending to do them uh, passed on among secret brotherhoods and organizations because these are very powerful and dangerous ideas, dangerous to status quo, dangerous to institutionalized religion. So there's a, an element of underground secrecy associated with some of these themes. These havens of safety began to flourish across Europe. Secret societies were instrumental in the new age of enlightenment that swept through Europe in the 1700s and even helped in the founding of American democracy. Participation in these organizations had fallen dramatically by the mid-1800s as they became more civic-minded and less interested in the occult. So what would cause a resurgence in the occult? In rural New York, two unlikely sisters would inspire a national obsession with the occult. Magic would once again capture imaginations. On March 31, 1848, sisters Leah and Margaret Fox publicly declared that they had contacted spirits from beyond the grave. An American fascination for communicating with the dead occurred almost overnight. The Fox sisters used a technique called a seance, which quickly became one of America's most popular pastimes. People gathered in a darkened room while a medium tried to make contact with the spirit world. There would be tambourines and other bells that would sound, 
and the medium would actually be able to exude you know, ectoplasm from their nostrils or their mouth and it was this sort of spiritual substance that allowed the spirits of the dead to manifest and make and appear and in other cases the medium would simply become a conduit or a channel through which the, the deceased were able to speak. Many who practiced spiritualism believed it would lead to scientific proof of the existence and immortality of the soul. And they gained an iconic champion when the Russian-born Madame Blavatsky arrived in New York at the height of spiritualism's popularity. She soon became the self-proclaimed decoder of ancient occult secrets. She grew up in a wonderful occult library that her father had established. She could see the connections between different cultures, spiritual teachings, and she was attempting to correct the errors of Christianity by bringing in mysticism and spirituality from other cultures. Born in the Ukraine in 1831 to a lower-ranking nobleman, Blavatsky was married early, but she abandoned her husband to spend 10 years traveling the world. She claimed to have studied with mystical adepts in India and Tibet. The exotic cigar-smoking medium became a sensation in the occult circles. She just wouldn't accept limits. She was one of the most educated person anybody who met her had ever met. And they couldn't understand, how could this powerful intellect be in this female body, just chewing up the landscape and producing this tremendous inspiration? Blavatsky's seances were the talk of New York. Mysterious letters would appear, written by spiritual leaders she called the Great White Brotherhood. Blavatsky was not above you know, taking advantage of the popularity of seances to push her own cause, and she used these seances to, in a very spectacular effect, to materialize letters written by these um, ascended masters as instructions being passed down to her. The Brotherhood dictated to her the books that became the foundation of a new science of mysticism, Theosophy. Blavatsky wrote um, essentially two gigantic uh, collections, Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine, which purported to be the teachings, the secret teachings of this kind of Eastern uh, Brotherhood, the mystery schools of initiation and she totally altered the spiritual landscape of Western civilization by introducing those concepts. She was very much a pioneer in bringing ideas of Eastern esotericism into the West. She focused on the similarities between Christianity and Hinduism and Buddhism and other spiritual traditions, arguing that there is in fact a tradition that underlies all spiritual faiths in the world. Blavatsky regarded her work as spiritual science and made connections between recent scientific advancements and occult beliefs. Blavatsky promoted the ancient Eastern mystical view that the essential nature of the world was not matter, but energy, which foreshadowed the discoveries of modern physics. Blavatsky also revived the Eastern beliefs in reincarnation and karma. Quickly acquiring a cult following, she launched the Theosophy Society. The term Theosophy, which Blavatsky coined, really comes from two words that are of Greek origin. One is Theos, which means God, and Sophia, which means wisdom. So the Theosophical Society was teaching divine or sacred wisdom. The Theosophical Society spread internationally and still exists in many countries. Blavatsky was hailed by her followers as the mother of the New Age. But for all of Blavatsky's charisma, she soon fell victim to her own success. And at the time that she was becoming famous, this business of spiritualism and channeling and especially uh, seances where you'd call up your dead ancestors, that was going all over the Western world and she felt like that was charlatanism. And so she wanted to represent an, a model that stepped outside of that and spoke to the verities, the truths, the larger things. But unfortunately, in the end, she got reduced down to the very thing she was trying to fight. In 1885, Blavatsky was investigated by London Society for Psychical Research. It concluded that her seances were rigged. Writings didn't magically come from beyond the grave. 
there was a spring-loaded device in the bedroom above her chamber that allowed, it some, that allowed someone to put a letter into this device and have it drop down between the floorboards and materialize in their hands. Though many devoted followers refused to abandon Theosophy, Blavatsky was now tainted with fraud. She died soon afterwards. Her followers established a new headquarters in India where Theosophy thrived. A young protege, Krishnamurti, was identified as a reincarnated master and groomed to lead the Theosophy Society into the 20th century. Blavatsky's synthesis of Eastern and Western spirituality broke new ground in occultism. A man described by newspapers as the most wickedest man alive claimed he had penetrated even deeper into mysteries. Born in 1875, Aleister Crowley was raised in a strict religious household. His mother nicknamed him the Beast from the Book of Revelation. It was a title he embraced his entire life. He identified himself as the Antichrist, as the uh, force that would take away this terrible Christian program which had so warped his childhood. Crowley began studying the occult as a member of the Golden Dawn. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was the secret society par excellence of the Victorian age in England. It brought together, again, the knowledge that was available at that point in time. So you had tarot, and you had Kabbalah, and you had John Dee's angelic magic and Rosicrucian traditions all being melded together under a single system. The Golden Dawn attracted many of the London intelligentsia. Crowley, though, ultimately broke away from the group. He would find his own system of belief after a trip to Egypt where his wife received a mystical signal that told him to prepare himself for a message from the gods. Heeding the call, he began spontaneously writing a book he called the Book of the Law. This book an announces a new law for mankind. And in fact, it tells us that we are very emboldened and, and brightened spiritual entity that in fact you know, we are a as the gods. The Book of the Law was another synthesis of Eastern and Western spirituality. Crowley called his new system the Lima. It incorporated principles of magic that he said he had learned from ancient Egyptian and other occult sources. He became a self-proclaimed master of action at a distance, focusing the power of his intention or will to create desired effects. Aleister Crowley defined magic as the art and science of causing change to occur in conformity with the will. And his whole approach is basically to empower the practitioner to make their intentions happen, to materialize what they want to have happen in the world. Thalima's fundamental law was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. While this may have meant pursuing a higher path for some, for others, it excused every variety of deviant behavior. Some critics claim that Crowley himself was one of its worst offenders. Crowley was practicing sexuality as a spiritual path. He reduced a great deal of symbolic teachings to their essence, which is essentially the duality or the polarity between male and female and he uh, experimented greatly within, within that sphere to understand what, it, what mysteries were contained within the sexual act. Crowley went on to start his own secret society, the Ordo Templi Orientis, and wrote numerous books about meditation and ceremonial magic. He also helped reinterpret Tarot for the 20th century. The Tarot is a pictorial representation of occult teachings. It's a uh, method of going within and contacting archetypal levels within oneself, spiritual levels, and entering meditative state in which intuition is heightened and maybe even, you know, where you can see certain patterns developing because you're in the right state of mind. While popularized by Italian noblemen in the 1300s as playing cards, some say Tarot's origins date to ancient Egypt. Over time, they acquired occult significance. Crowley developed a deck of his own called the Book of Thoth, based on the Egyptian magic he had studied. 
A popular divination tool today, Tarot is said to reveal information about the seeker and the questions about his future. Everything that's related in one moment of time is all connected. So if two people come together around a question and they're manipulating an oracular tool like this, but if that manipulation is intended to serve the need and the feeling, then it will make a mirroring reflection of the energy that's produced between the two people. Crowley's writings, like Madame Blavatsky's, were heralded as forerunners of many New Age ideas. But despite his serious work in occultism, ultimately he became infamous for his use of drugs and decadent sexual behavior. As Hitler rose to power in the 1930s, Crowley's reputation was fatally damaged. He wrote pro-Nazi propaganda and was soon an outcast. After World War II, it was rumored that Hitler had used Crowley's and Madame Blavatsky's writings to help him create his theory of a master race. I don't think there's any evidence that Hitler read the works of Aleister Crowley per se. Um, it's, it's definitely known that Hitler and members of his regime had a very keen interest in the occult and they adopted the trappings of occult symbolism. Ill and addicted to opium, Crowley spent his final days in a boarding house and died in 1947. Like other occultists before him, Crowley attempted to learn the secrets of the gods, only to be discredited and condemned by society. I think that in the cases of these great thinkers in history that we see ultimately being persecuted for their beliefs, what's happening there is that these people are very forward thinking and they challenge our preconceptions. They make people uncomfortable. From that level of discomfort and that level of fear and that threat that, that thinking has to people's power base that leads societies and governments and other institutions to act against people who speak out in that way. Once again, occultism seemed to disappear. It would take the drugs, rebellion, and social upheaval of the 1960s to usher in its next revival. Occult practices languished on the fringes of society for most of the 20th century, but they resurfaced during the hippie movement of the 60s. Popular gurus like the Maharishi and Timothy Leary promoted altered states of consciousness that could lead to higher levels of self-awareness. Individualism became the goal of millions of young people who rejected traditional religion to find their own direct route to God. By the 1980s, New Age ideas had become mainstream. Madame Blavatsky's writings became pivotal in reinterpreting occultism for modern audiences, and even Aleister Crowley's reputation was somewhat restored. There was this boom in occult interest that resulted in Crowley being almost a pop culture icon. The Beatles put Aleister Crowley on the cover of Sgt. Pepper. You have musicians like David Bowie and um, Jimmy Page becoming very interested in Crowley. He experienced a renaissance, as it were, in the 60s and 70s and has been a very popular figure ever since. Occult belief systems are now embraced by millions of New Age followers who pick and choose from their wide array of concepts to fashion their own individual brand of spirituality. Yet the occult is still often regarded with suspicion. Many of those who practice occultism describe it as a modern mystical quest. The mystical quest is the process by which a limited, time-space-bound human being can transcend their background and history and come into this divinized or macrocosmic consciousness. And that is the process of becoming immortal, you know, leaving this physical flesh behind and being successively identified with larger and larger realms of reality. The holistic philosophy of New Age beliefs continues to grow in popularity. We're surrounded by material wealth and technology, and we feel like we've lost something. We've lost that connectedness. We've lost the understanding of our human roots. And a lot of the interest in New Age ideas and a lot of the look back to ancient ideas uh, stems from that desire to reconnect with that history and to make us feel more whole, more spiritual, more connected, more aware of the passion and meaning of life around us. But what began as occult magic has informed the world of science. 
There were attempts, legitimate attempts, to try to understand the way the world works. And there would, there would not be astronomy today if it had not been for the ancient astrologers who studied the heavens. There would not be chemistry today if it weren't for the alchemists who did their thing as well. Some of the secrets that they thought they were working on were the secret of eternal life, um, the secret of being able to be um, uh, without disease, then the great secrets of transformation, let's say, of lead into gold, but that's like not the only one. Maybe one of the transformations is the human being into a godlike thing. Um, and, and, and it's a wonderful thing that uh, now we come around to uh, particle physics and people thinking that life is pure energy and that maybe there is a connection between those ideas that maybe the, the power to become godlike is in the uh, ability to transform yourself. Medicine and science have benefited from the input of occultism. And in the future, what we think of as magic may play a role in even greater discoveries. In our push to science, we're a culture of specialists, very focused on particular areas. So I think some of that holistic nature from the past is necessary to make the breakthroughs that we are currently not able to make in science. Beliefs can blind us, whether they're religious beliefs or scientific beliefs. And the great thing about these occult sorts of experiments is that they keep us open to possibility. Despite the progress made by science, the modern world is still full of mysteries that may never be solved. It's the unknowable, it's the mystery. And that mystery is the center of the spiritual quest. But it's also the center of the scientific quest and the artistic quest. That is what we're here on Earth to do, is seek after that mystery. Like the first occultists, modern scientists will continue to search for ways to divine the mysteries of our world and the forces that have created them.